Good evening. Welcome to the Trinity Channel. And today we have a very, very special show for you. Today we're going to have a live discussion between our own David Wood. Dr. David Wood, I'm sorry. You can call me David. Uh, don't beat me after the <laughs> we show. We're friends, dude. We're friends. <laughs> and Mr. Farhan Qureshi, who has appeared on the show before. And these brothers of ours are going to discuss the topic how should we confront the Islamic challenge? And during this time, during this, uh, you could call it debate, discussion, uh, whatever you want to call it, we're gonna, they're going to talk about just how should we approach our apologetics and our evangelism. Last night, if you tuned in, you heard a lot of uh, verses. One of the verses you heard was 1 Peter 3.15. And in first three, first Peter three fifteen, at the end of the verse, it says to offer a defense of the faith with gentleness, but with also with truth. So how do we balance gentleness and truth? We're going to discuss that tonight, and we're going to come to a conclusion. So we're going to have a opening statements from both of our uh, participants, both being eight minutes. And the first uh, opening statement is going to be from uh, Dr. David Wood for eight minutes. Are you ready? Are you ready? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Go good. Ahead. <laughs> All right, well, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, of course, this is a very important topic. If you've noticed, there is a massive problem in the world. And, you know, the, the one we've been focusing on is ISIS, where people have had their heads chopped off uh, on a seemingly daily basis, where large sections of entire countries are being taken over by straightforward jihadists, and uh, women are being raped. It's a really bad situation, but the, even though we've been focusing on ISIS, uh, ISIS isn't the only problem. You also have Boko Haram uh, kidnapping women left and right, raping them and sometimes ransoming them, ransoming them back, sometimes marrying them off. Uh, you have al-Shabaab in Somalia. You have the Taliban in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. You have uh, al-Qaeda still uh, trying to get, get, it, get the attention back on them. You have all kinds of terrorist groups uh, who somehow, despite the fact that they come from very different, uh, very different countries, Somehow come to the conclude that somehow come to conclude that they are commanded to wage jihad and that this is how they're supposed to go uh, about uh, serving Allah in this world. So there's obviously a challenge, and we're here to address how to confront that challenge. And this can be a different issue depending on whether you're Christian or um, non-Muslim, whether you're uh, a, a government leader or a regular person. I, I, I'm assuming that Farhan and I aren't talking about what the military needs to do or what the government or the United Nations needs to do. When we talk about uh, what should, how should we confront the Islamic challenge, I'm assuming we're talking about people like us, average people in the world, what can we actually do about this challenge? And it, there, was a, there was a famous little bit with, uh, with Ben Affleck recently where he threw a big tantrum on Real Talk because uh, Bill Maher and Sam Harris uh, had the nerve to say that Islam is more dangerous than other religions and other ideologies. And uh, most of what Ben Affleck said, I think, is, is ridiculous. But he, he said one very important thing, and it was a question. He sort of lifted his head and said, so what's your solution? And I think that is a very important question, one which, uh, which we're here to address tonight. What's the solution? Because if think about it. If you run around telling everyone that Islam is violent, that it calls for jihad, that it allows men to rape their female captives, uh, that Islam is all about dominating and subjugating the entire world. Well, suppose lots of people, suppose the entire population becomes convinced that that's what Islam teaches. You have to wonder, what are the odds that someone's going to go just go targeting random Muslims who aren't waging jihad, right? What, what, that, so, that seems like a legitimate concern. If everyone becomes convinced that Islam is violent and dangerous, what about, you know, the, 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 the nice Muslim who lives down the street and is just working his job and has never thought about jihad in his life? Well, that's a concern. And so the question is, how do we sort of work through this issue? We want to confront the Islamic challenge. But at the same time, we don't want, you know, we don't want people hurt. I don't want to see anyone hurt. I would rather see ISIS uh, all change their minds about what jihad is and what Islam teaches and whether Islam is true and turn away from all of those things. 
That's what I would like to see. Um, that's, that's not going to happen. So we have to say, what can we do uh, here, right, here and now? And uh, my view is simple and peaceful. Ben Affleck wanted to know what the solution is. My solution would be peaceful and simple. Of course, there's going to have to be military engagements and uh, you know, governments protecting people and stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people like us. What can we do? Uh, I believe that Islam cannot withstand criticism. It, Islam cannot withstand open, straightforward criticism. We're talking, when we're talking about Muhammad, we're talking about a guy who had sex with a nine-year-old girl who had more wives than his own revelations uh, allowed to, uh, to Muslims. Um, a guy who married the divorced wife of his own adopted son after he caused the breakup. We're talking about a guy whose first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic. We're talking about a guy who became suicidal after receiving his revelations, tried to hurl himself off a cliff. A guy who delivered revelations to his followers, then came back and said the devil tricked him into delivering those revelations. We're talking about a guy who started acting weird for about a year and a half, came back and said it was because someone had cast a magic spell on him. This is the one, probably the least reliable person in all of history that you could choose as a prophet, and yet your average Muslim doesn't know anything about any of this. Why? Their leaders keep them insulated from these facts about Muhammad because they don't want them to leave Islam. And when people convert to Islam in the West, I have never met a person who converted to Islam after doing a careful study of the Quran and the Hadith. Why? Because they would have found out, wow, this guy really, really doesn't look like a prophet. Based on the fact that Muslims are keeping this material, um, and I mean Muslim leaders, based on the fact that Muslim leaders are keeping this material um, uh, hidden from you know, your average Muslim, and the fact that people just don't convert to Islam after studying this material, I conclude that there's a reason for it. That once all the facts are on the table, most people would either not become Muslim or certainly wouldn't have very much confidence in it. I'm not saying everyone is like that. You can read all the Quran and, and the Hadith and just you know, love it. Go out there, wage jihad and take your captives and all these things. Uh, you, you, could, you, you could do that. But the point is, I don't think most people would. I don't think once, once all of the facts about Muhammad are on the table, I don't think that most people are going to take it seriously. So my solution would be that we need to get the facts about Muhammad. And, and by the way, it's not like there's a solution. There are all kinds of things that need to get done. What I'm talking about is, if I could sort of change one thing and get one thing um, sort of out there, it would be to get the facts about Muhammad into the realm of common knowledge. So that wherever you go, people know what Islam teaches uh, about women and about how uh, men can beat their wives and um, take captives and so on. What it teaches about women, what it teaches about jihad, uh, Muhammad's life, to get these into the realm of common knowledge. If that can happen, if that can happen, one, I don't think you're going to see too many people converting to Islam, and so you're not going to have these sort of uh, lone wolf jihadists who converted to Islam, um, and I think you'll have more people leaving Islam, and even the people who still are Muslims, I don't think that many of them are going to have the confidence, if they really know a lot of the facts about Muhammad, to run out and wage jihad. Why do I say that? Because when I look at the jihadist pages, I see some of the, the, the silliest nonsense about Muhammad ever. And it's very silly if you've read uh, the history of Muhammad, some of the things they're saying. So lots, there's a great deal of ignorance out there. If we can break through that ignorance and get the facts on the table, I think everyone's better off. I think uh, non-Muslims are better off. 40 seconds. I think non-Muslims are better off. I also think peaceful Muslims in the West are better off. If we are allowed to openly discuss and even criticize Islam, which we can't do now, you'd be called a racist and a bigot and a hate monger and everything, um, if we are able to openly discuss and criticize Islam, I think that will uh, reduce a lot of the people's concerns about Islam, if they can just talk about it. And I think even Muslims, peaceful Muslims in the West, are better off, are better off if we can openly, honestly discuss their prophet and their book. Thank you very much for that opening statement. And Eight minutes of opening statement Thank you for the for position that. of using a more uh, direct approach in uh, apologetics. Now for uh, a opening statement from 
Farhan Qureshi, who is coming with the opposite opinion, is he? taking the opposite. Uh, I think Farhan might agree with me on a, on a lot of well, what I, I said. I, I, well, let's I, see. Let's see. It, it might happen. It just might happen. <laughs> but we'll let Farhan tell us that. So, Farhan, you have eight minutes to give us your position, starting now. Okay, sure. Now, I mean, in terms of uh, whether I agree with David or not, I do agree with David. I think that the tactics that we might employ are, are, are a bit different and perhaps that I'm a little bit more sensitive toward uh, towards people in general in terms of how they would emotionally respond to some of uh, that open criticism to Islam and I'll get into that a little bit but what I do want to cover first and foremost is, is to say that nobody can have a monopoly on any religion and if there are 1.4 billion individuals who profess Islam then inevitably there are going to be 1.4 subjective perceptions on what Islam is. And the argument over who is right or wrong could go on forever. And even when exegesis or original interpretation is attempted, sectarianism surfaces, it, surfaces its face and challenges any claims being made. And so when we deal with such a large population of people, we should realize that in the midst of this population, naturally there's going to be human personalities who incline toward a range of thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors. There's going to be professed Muslims who are delusional, stubborn, rigid, hostile, emotional, irrational, violent, ignorant, and, uh, and uneducated, just as much as there will be benevolent, spiritual, rational, intelligent, peaceful, and educated Muslims out there as well. Both sides of the spectrum exist, and every possibility in between does as well. Each side of the spe spectrum focuses on passages, verses, and narrations that further their personal approach. The rigid conservatives will further their attitudes by quoting passages that justify their means, and the passive liberals will quote passages that justify their means. The same can be said of any religion. It's simply a matter of specific personality types uh, having the means that they are looking for to express themselves. Um, and so that's the first uh, point that I wanted to cover is that when we're dealing with such a big population, there's going to be all sorts of people that we're dealing with and their biochemical makeup, their personalities, their, their conditioning is going to influence how they perceive Islam and what types of verses they're influenced by. And so when we look at Islam, we want to look at it from different angles. We want to look at the whole picture, but we want to look at it from different angles. So we want, first we can ask questions from a theological perspective, we can ask questions from a psychological, sociological, and cultural perspective, and also we can go and look at it from a political and diplomatic perspective as well, and I know that you don't want to get into the politics of it, and that's fine. But first and foremost, I guess my question to you was, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to po posit some questions that from a theological perspective, you know, it, we talked about gentleness in the beginning, we talked about uh, uh, love your enemy. We talk, you know. There's there's other verses like that. You know, turn the other cheek and stuff like that. And so when when we look at those verses, within the context of those passages, how can we confront, you know, hostile Muslims? Are we going? Is it truly gentle, and polite, and inviting to pretty much? tell Muslims that, they're, that their prophet's a pedophile, he married all these women, you know, the entire list of what you said, you want, you want all the facts about Muhammad out there. But in terms of tactics, is that a reasonable and is it a feasible approach, you know, in the spirit of turning the other cheek and loving your enemy and so on and so forth? What is the reaction and response you're going to get when you come out with all of these quote-unquote facts? And a lot of those things are facts, I'm not saying that they're not, but it's how you present those facts and, uh, and, and how the other person perceives what it is that you're presenting them. And I think that that's a very important um, a, a tactic and methodology in terms of whether the Muslim is going to be insulted and offended and is going to become defensive and defense mechanisms are going to come into play or whether they're going to be receptive and actually want to listen to what you have to say. And and so the all so so that theological question is is what I want to start off with. Um, so the second question that I had had to do with theodicy, since David and I engaged the problem of evil before, um, in that evil exists, and it, whether it emerges through Islam or any other means, that it is a part of God's plan, and so. 
the the idea is to respond to it through compassion and not more hostility. But I don't think David is going to disagree with that, right? So I think what what we're eventually going to get into is is our tactics and how we present the facts that we want to pre- pre- present and whether it's it's right and 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 ethical to present facts the way that you know you know David and others have presented them that have provoked Muslim uh, behaviors to say the least. Now what I will say is that there is an emotional attachment that comes along with being a Muslim or, or being anything for that matter. It doesn't matter if it's racial, ethnic, cultural. Th- there, there's an emotional attachment to one. How much time? Okay. So if there's an emotional attachment to one's, ide- and one's identity and that identity is challenged or offended in any type of way, then you're going to get a reaction and you're going to push people away. And so my question is, do you want to push them away or do you want to soften their hearts first and and you know and then get into get get into some of those some of those facts that that you want to get into and how are you going to present are you going to call Muhammad a pedophile or are you going to say look is this how you want how you want modern day society to deal with you know or deal with marrying off children and whatnot and see the way that I presented it a Muslim might be might be willing to hear me out but the way David presented it in his opening statement in my opinion, that's going to push people away, and and that's what I, I definitely want to um, definitely want to enforce. But not only that, when you think about the peaceful Muslims who are willing to listen, you know, are, are is it do, do you want to push them away or do you want them to listen? And that's and that's a big piece of what I I, I guess the the concern that I've had and and concerns that uh, uh, Muslims have had, Muslims that I've talked to have had when talking to you know what they call islamophobes uh, i think that they have their own westophobia uh t- issues themselves but we're not going to get into those so that so the question comes down to tactics dave um and, and not so much whether we need to confront these issues or not i'm all about criticizing islam and muhammad but in the right way and in a way that that Muslims are willing to listen and hear what you have to say, and um, and one way to do that is to acknowledge the good things that do come with Islam, the good things that seconds. do come with Muhammad. What's that? Forty seconds left. Okay, so I'll conclude with that, and if there's any other points, I'll I'll make them in the rebuttal. Right, Farhan, you good with uh with four minute rebuttals? Yeah. Okay. I am. Okay. Good. All right, so we, we move into this next part, which is the rebuttal, uh, which are going to be four minutes each. So starting with David, you have your four minutes to rebut his points. All right, now Farhan's first point was that um, there are subjective interpretations, subjective perspectives on Islam because, you know, human beings aren't the sort of things that just get a command and then, uh, you know, that they're, they're, they're just set in that uh, way. In other words, you don't end up with, if, if 1.4 or 1.6 billion Muslims say they follow Islam, you're not going to end up with uh, 1.4 or 1.6 billion people believing and doing the exact same things. Why? Because there are a lot more influences on us than just the religion we believe in. With that said, which, which I agree with, with that said, um, think about it. Uh, Christianity has many, many different uh, you know, individuals, different backgrounds, different um, genetic makeups. So does Hinduism and so on. And yet it's one. It's one particular ideology that continually ends up uh, promoting terrorism and suicide bombings and beheadings and honor killings and all of these things. Uh, so the point is, given that people are different, there is something about Islam that is more than just personal private perspective because it, people in completely different areas end up doing the same thing. Not everyone, not everyone, but to a much higher degree than other ideologies. And so we're not just talking about personal perspective here. There's, some, there's something more there. Um, Farhan wants to know if it's reasonable to share the facts about Muhammad uh, with Muslims. I think he, he concluded that he did. Um, and I, you know, I would agree with that. I think people need to get it. And, and as far as tactics are concerned, uh, I, I never walked up to a Muslim and said, your, your prophet's a pedophile or anything like that. I do want to get the point across that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Um, you can do that in a, in, a, in a gentle manner. You can say, hey, uh, you know, I just read this article, um, I re- or I read the hadith. It says this about Muhammad. I was wondering what you, my Muslim friend, 
think about that. I was wondering, I'm wondering what you think about that sort of thing. And could you, you know, talk to your mom, get back to me, and share your views with me? So I'm fine with that. I don't run around in the street saying, you know, I hate you Muslims, and never, never, uh, never done it. Now, I am far more aggressive, I think, than lots of people in that I will, I will say it. I will put it on the internet. I'll make YouTube videos. Um, I'm, I'm certainly very cheeky and sarcastic in my videos. Um, I do. I would say I, I make fun of Muhammad in my videos. Uh, not because I'm saying that's the way to do things, but because there are already Christians who are, who are very nice and very loving doing things like that. I'm kind of focusing on a different sort of group. I'm, I'm focusing on people who are more, uh, who are more aggressive. And I'm sure Fahan knows this, there are lots of Muslims in the world who come from a more aggressive background. They only listen to you if you're more forceful. They don't, they don't respect it if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're just laid back and, 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 and gentle. They regard it as weakness. I found this out um, in, my, in my early interactions with Nabil. We would watch a debate. I would think it was completely one-sided massacre. And Nabil would say the Muslim one. And I would be saying, how can you say the Muslim one when he started yelling and screaming because he, couldn't have, he didn't have any arguments? And Nabil's perspective was, he was yelling and screaming because he was passionate because he knows the truth is on his side. So in the West, we look at something like that and say, ah, this guy's yelling because he knows he's losing. Whereas certain people will look at that and say he's yelling. He's yelling because he's passionate that he has the truth. And so there are different perspectives. But um, I, I just want to say, Farhan, from personal experience, I hear from former Muslims regularly who said, you know, look, man, I was really ticked off when I started watching your videos. But, you know, I just wanted to watch them so I could refute them. But... And then they end up becoming, uh, either leaving Islam, becoming Christian, or leaving Islam and becoming agnostic. But I hear from that regularly. So there are people who do respond to a more confrontational approach. By the way, I'm the same way. I, I, I respond to a more confrontational approach rather than someone uh, you know, tiptoeing around. And so it's basically there are different approaches for different kinds of people. And I'm sure you would agree with Euros. that. <clears throat> Thank you, David. And now for, uh, for Han, it's, now, it's time for your, uh, uh, your time to rebut. Are you there, Han? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, okay. Great. The clock is set. Your time is ready. Okay, so no, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of you know, the confrontational approach and how it does get to someone, but, but you have to put into play there that, that you could be potentially pushing people away that are more susceptible to hearing you know Christ's message or something alternative and that that possibility is out there as well and the reality situation is the ones that are already hostile the ones are, that are already rigid you're only going to push them further and further into their delusion by confronting them the way that you do it, that there are many cases where you do that as well now now, now, even I, and you know this, Dave, like when I used to hear, hear some of the things that you said, um, you know, I, I was offended, but I was also listening to a variety of different perspectives, variety of different speakers on a variety of different topics, and ultimately that led me, you know, out of Islam. And so there, there are always di different voices, but it all depends on who you're listening to. And the idea is that if... If you're going to if you're going to be confrontational, you have to realize that you might be pushing people away as well. And is it worth it, especially if when you're dealing with confrontational people, if you're making their faith stronger rather than than humbling them to the truth? Uh, the other thing you said something about the population and subjective perception. Um, and I agree that every religion has a foundation. You know, for example, Islam has a kalima, or you know, the, the, each one has a creed, right? But from that, from that basic perspective, even from the foundation, I would say that each individual has a subjective perception of that foundation. So, for example, you and CL, while you have a foundation that Christ is your Lord and Savior, how you each individually perceive that, and how you interpret it in terms of what's going on in reality, in terms of what's going on in life is different. No matter what symbols or languages or words you use that are similar, each of you has a, has a unique perception on what that means to you specifically. And so there is a subjective aspect to religion and how people interpret it. And like I said, passive liberals are going to pursue verses to justify their means, and rigid conservatives are going to pursue passages and verses that justify their means. And so that's just the nature of, 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 of what we're talking about. Um, 
Now, I don't, I don't find too much disagreement about, you know, putting the facts out there. And the gentle way that you put your facts out there about uh, Muhammad's controversial marriage to Aisha, the way you did it there was perfect. You know, I, it, was, it, was, it, was, it seemed like it was a genuine way to inquire about a controversial issue without provoking them to, to you know, to either react or feel insulted and, and, and now you've pushed them away. Um, do you, I guess my question to you, Dave, is do you feel that you are pushing people away? And in terms of those who are confrontational, do you think that you're just making them more confrontational and more hostile? Do you think that that's a possibility? And in the end, is it worth it? And then when you translate that on, onto a bigger scale, you get terrorism because people are being provoked. Um, and that's dangerous. You know, so for example, the Quran burner in Florida, he literally caused people to go nuts. And, and that's what well, we have to be very careful with our tactics. And especially Less when we're looking at, at biblical suggestions on how you should deal with it. I think that, you know, as Christians, you, you guys should follow whatever those suggestions are. And if you have any verses that, that, that would imply that, you know, confront hostility with hostility, then I would like to hear those verses as well. Thank you, thank you. And that was the opening statements. We had two opening statements, each eight minutes, and we had two rebuttals, each four minutes. And we're going to take a uh, slight break at this point for 60 seconds and just stay tuned. Don't go anywhere because there's going to be more dialogue and there's going to be some back and forth questioning going between our, our debaters. And you want to check that out. So stay around. And we are back. The Trinity Channel we have today for Han Kureishi and we have David Wood. And we're discussing how should we confront the Islamic challenge. We in a previous uh, segment, we had opening statements and rebuttals. And now in this part, we're going to have like an open discussion, a back and forth between our two debaters. And we're going to start off with uh, David. He's going to open up the discussion and, and ask uh, Farhan a few questions. And um, yeah, Farhan, uh, uh, we, we certainly want to get to the, uh, to, to the tactics, but at the end it sounded like you were um, asking if there's any basis in Christianity for being confrontational. And absolutely, I, I think I'm far less confrontational than Jesus was. I think I'm far less confrontational than Paul was. And this is, let me give you an example. This is Jesus talking to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. When you've succeeded, you make them twice as much of a child as hell, a child of hell as you are. These are very strong words, and this just continues, right? I mean, he's just, he's just blasting people. Um, and you find Paul doing the same thing in various circumstances. Um, but a, a, as someone, uh, I, saw, um, uh, I think it was John Eldridge who pointed out, uh, who was Jesus more like, he asked. Uh, was he more like William Wallace or Mother Teresa, right? Was he gentle and, and loving and hugging you, uh, if you're Mother Teresa, like Mother Teresa? Or was he more like William Wallace, the, you know, the brave heart? And he said that kind of depends on who you were. If you were a, a, you know, a, an oppressive person, Jesus was coming at you like William Wallace. If you were a, you know, a broken outcast of society, he'd come to you like, like Mother Teresa. And there are, there are some very brutal um, people in this world. And it, it seems like, well, since there are people who are going to be offended or upset if we tell the truth, therefore we don't need to tell these, these people and really just blast them with the truth that you're following a false religion and you're going out chopping people's heads off in the name of a false religion, that we don't need to, to blast them that because we might hurt people's feelings. And that's, that, I, I just disagree. If people's feelings get hurt, I mean, people, I mean, people's feelings get hurt about Christianity all the time, just based on watching The Simpsons or something like that. It doesn't stop them. And so why should it stop us from talking about Islam? Okay, thank you, David. Farhan, you want to answer that? Sure. I, I mean, I don't think that it's about hurting feelings as much as the consequences that come, come as a result of what we're saying and doing. It's, so, for example, if, if we come out and, and just attack Muhammad or make fun of Muhammad, what is the consequence of that? So I'm not against telling the truth at all. I'm not against being assertive. I'm not against, you know, talking about relevant yet controversial issues. It's about how we do it and about the consequences that come from how we do, do uh, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, whether it's, 
you know, talking about Muhammad or talking about Islam. So that's that's what I think it 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 comes down to. It's not just the feelings, but the consequences of how we deal with it. Um, did did you did you want to ask something back or? How, oh, how sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, so I, I wanted to take it a little bit because we were talking about the challenge of Islam and, and, and there's so much that can be said about that that particular title. I guess I'll, one of the fears that, you know, the whole concept of, of Islamophobia is that people, people, some Muslims feel as if that uh, that there's fear, that, that people are trying to spread fear about Islam and they find themselves affected when they're going to airports or you know when they're going to certain cashiers or certain areas that now because everybody's always talking specifically about Islam and Muslims in, one, in, a, in a particular type of way then now you know even though that they're innocent and now they have to deal with it how would you respond to those Muslims? Uh, I, I would say that that's just not our culture there are people uh, I think there are reasons that there are many Muslims think like that because in certain Islamic cultures around the world, if you start criticizing someone, you end up killing each other over, over, over the issue you're debating. We just don't do that. There are isolated cases of an individual who might do that. But when we discuss an ideology, uh, we could blast the ideology, right? I mean, you and, me, you, you and I could sit down, have a disagreement, and argue all night long and completely disagree. Uh, we're not going to start killing each other. Uh, so when we talk about something like Islam, um, if you say, oh, you start criticizing Islam and, 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 and poking fun at Muhammad, then, you know, it's Islamophobic and you might go on a killing spree. People make fun of Jesus all the time. People make fun of all kinds of things all the time. It never crosses anyone's mind that, hey, we're going to go out and start uh, a killing spree. Now, with that said, I think that sort of, you know, guarding Islam from criticism um, or, or not treating Islam the way you treat other ideologies by poking fun of it or making fun of it on The Simpsons or South Park like that, by keeping it sort of insulated from that kind of response, I think that does more. I think that does more to instill fear in people's hearts, right? Because there's this one ideology out there that we're just not allowed to treat like that. Well, that makes me wonder why. And then I see beheadings in the name of that religion. That scares me. I think it would do much more to dispel people's fears and concerns about Islam if we were just allowed to talk about it uh, without either being killed, as, as you would in a you know, place like Pakistan if you criticize Islam, or being called a racist or a bigot for, for, for talking uh, for talking about the Quran. So I think it would do much more, both for, for, for Muslims living in the West and for non-Muslims, if we were allowed to just, hey, lighten up here. Let's, let's, let's talk about Islam uh, just like we talk about anything else. Let's joke about it like we joke about anything else. I think that would actually help rather than, hey, let's keep it, let's keep it all quiet or you're racist or a bigot. That, that, that makes people nervous. That makes me nervous when I hear, I don't care what it is, it doesn't have to be Islam. If I hear, hey, you're not allowed to talk about that, uh, or you're not allowed to make fun of that. You may make fun of anything else, but not that. That scares me, right? Because I think there's something different about this thing over here. Mm -hmm. For Han? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that, there's, that there's, there is a, an, an issue of freedom of speech, and then there's an issue of, of sensitivity. That, like if I was in the work, if, if I was in a professional environment or a work environment or in a church environment, I, I have to behave myself a certain type of way. And so... You know, I'm not going to say things, uh, I'm not going to go in there making, go to a church making fun of Christianity, or I'm not going to be at work knowing that there's a Muslim two feet away from me and, and making fun of Muhammad, because I'm, I'm sensitive to what that's going to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt the person's feelings, and it's going to cause harm. And it's not just an issue of hurting their feelings. It, it could lead to all sorts of psychological trauma. You know, it's not just an issue of hurt, hurting feelings. There's, the, the, these events are traumatic and can have long-term effects on people. Uh, this is something that we know and we, we've studied. And so it, it, there, there's an issue of freedom of speech, which I respect, which you're talking about. I think all traditions should be treated equally and whether they make fun of them or don't make fun of them personally I don't I think we should be sensitive and not fake make, make fun of any any religion or any race or any nationality but I think that people should have the freedom to do so every bit as pe people should have the freedom of not listening to that to, to that garbage and so you know I, I think it's an issue of of being sensitive and when you take it to the level of newspapers and professionals and and politicians and and, and theologians and pastors, I think that there's a certain way to act and there's a certain there's a certain obligation to be sensitive of human beings knowing that this could cause trauma or harm. 
I, I think we're about I think we're about to get uh, about to get closer um, to a, a kind of solution here because you, you you're pointing out that you know the, criticizing Muhammad and you know criticizing Muhammad like we would criticize other things that could lead to a you know psychological trauma and so on. Um, I, I think that's the problem. CL, uh, you you encounter people making fun of Jesus all the time, right? TV uh, TV shows, yes. right? Actually, I just saw today someone uh, posted a prayer on Facebook and someone answered uh, replied with laughter. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, I say that all the time, every, every, every time I open uh, Facebook. Um, are you psychologically traumatized from that? I, I, you know, it, so some of it can make me upset, but I, 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 don't, I don't know if I would go as far as saying psychologically. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I, I don't know. I don't know any Christians who are sort of psychologically traumatized by the, the constant, endless ridicule of, of Christianity. Um, but you, Farhan is right. Farhan is right. Um, Muslims can get very, very upset um, yes. about criticism of Muhammad, but I think yes. the reason for that, Farhan, is that Islam has been insulated from a lot of the criticism, right? You don't turn, the Simpsons have never made fun of Islam. Uh, South Park tried to, they got threatened with death, and then they, they censored a ton of the episodes so that it wasn't offensive. So what, what I think the problem is, human beings can get used to just about anything. If, it, if, if, if Islam were treated the way other things are treated, now in a, in a world like, like you're saying, well, we just shouldn't make fun of anything, uh, that's fine. But we actually live in a world where people make fun of anything they disagree with. And you know, that, that can be bad in one way. I think it's great in another way, mean in, in that we don't start killing and slaughtering people that we, that, we, that we disagree with. We start making fun of them. And the reason that's good is, historically, lots of people down through history and lots of people in various places in the world today, if you have a disagreement, you start killing and slaughtering each other. Here in the West, if we have a disagreement, we start making fun of each other and poking fun at each other. And so, again, that's bad because, you know, you're talking about things that are important to people. You're talking about Jesus. You're talking about the Bible. You're talking about, you're talking about things that people hold very dear. But, hey, you're not killing people over it. And in that, I rejoice. And so what I would like to see is Muslims be brought into that sort of environment, that sort of cultural ideal where, um, hey, yeah, people are going to make fun of Muhammad. People are going to hurt your feelings. People might burn the Quran, but they're not killing you. They're not slaughtering you. So be happy that things aren't getting, getting handled the way ISIS handles them or the way Boko Haram handles them. Be happy that people aren't killing and slaughtering each other. And that can only, hap that can only happen if we sort of break through um, a, a lot of the past and get to the point where Muslims get used to, Muslims are used to the fact that, hey, over here you won't get killed for it, but people can ridicule it. And the only way to do that is to kind of do it. And so, yes, it's rough. Uh, you, you and I, you know, by, by the way, I like, sitting on my, I like sitting on my bed and reading all day. I'm, 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 I'm criticizing Islam because I think it has to be done, not just, not for my benefit, uh, but for the benefit of the world and even for the benefit of Muslims. I think Muslims themselves are much better off if they get it through their heads that they don't have to be psychologically traumatized because some guy over here makes fun of, makes fun of Muhammad or some guy down in Florida burns a Quran, you don't have to freak out about it. But it kind of won't happen unless, it, you know, unless they get through that situation. Everyone else has had to do that, right? Every other, every other group has had to get through that. Hey, everyone's making fun of me, and it's okay. I'm not getting killed. Um, and I want to sort of bring Muslims into that community with everyone else. I, I don't see how, that's, how they're worse off for that. Mm -hmm. Farhan? So a few things. I think I think asking CL, you know, how how he handles is, is kind of is kind of anecdotal. You know, he he doesn't he maybe he doesn't have a short fuse. Maybe he doesn't have the 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 chemistry and and the 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 life story that that somebody else has that who would re react in a different way. You know, it, there could in theory there could be a Christian who who sees the thing. And is is traumatized by it. Who watches South Park and sees Jesus being portrayed a certain type of way, and is traumatized traumatized by it. Just because CL isn't doesn't mean that others aren't. And and my and again, I'm not against criticizing Islam. Definitely not against criticizing Islam. It's about how you do it, and it's about whether you're making fun of it and what the consequences of this is. If it's going to cause people to die then you don't want to do it. And that's why South Park stopped doing it, because they wanted to see stop people stop dying. And, and here's my thing. If, if Christians aren't killing anyone when people make fun of Jesus, and, and Muslims are killing people when people make fun of Muhammad, it, do, it doesn't make it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't make it okay to, to, to criticize in either situation, if, if it is truly traumatizing people. 
in, in, in the same sense, what, what I'm trying to say is you can't cancel out, you know, Christians not doing it and Muslims doing it. You know, people who, who are susceptible to, 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 to th these types of behavior are going to react. They're going to react and they have reacted. And I would say that our culture is very different than what the culture is like in, in the Middle East. So there is a different social construct, different socioeconomic statuses, different levels of education. And primarily our culture is built to where we can have a little bit of a broader broader um, sense of humor. And, and we have to put that into perspective when dealing with Muslims who are brought up, even in the United States, they're being brought up in homes with a very different culture. And if that's the case, then that would define why Muslims are, are reacting the way that they are, is because the way that they're brought up, in, in addition to the, their biochemistry. So I, I'm for the free, uh, criticizing Islam, I'm for the free, free freedom of speech. I think that our, our tactics are failing, and that's why we, we, we haven't confronted Islam in the right way and that's why there's been more terrorism than 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 there needs to be um, yeah uh, let me get let me give an example since since we're okay. since we're, uh, we're you know we're on this topic of, of the cartoons in South Park um, the Danish there was the Danish cartoons um, that were there were in the Jylands Posten um, and cartoons were published and, and there, there were riots around the world um, so that was uh, very offensive, caused all kinds of uh, all kinds of riots. Um, then South Park, in order to try and stand up for freedom of speech, decided to have Muhammad in their episode, um, uh, like they'd had Jesus and Moses and, and God and everyone else in their episode. They're going to have Muhammad in an episode, and of course they're threatened with death. They back down, not because they're trying to save lives on the other side of the planet. They were trying to save their own lives there. Um, but after that, a woman named Molly Norris recommended, advocated, and everybody draw Muhammad Day, where she said, look, if thousands of people draw Muhammad, they can't kill everyone, so they're not, gonna, they're, they're not even going to try. And she was threatened into silence. She backed out of it, said she, you know, she, she condemns that sort of thing. Uh, but then there were thousands of people around the world who, I wasn't, just to clarify, I wasn't one of them, thousands of people around the world who drew cartoons of Muhammad. How many people died? from those thousands of cartoons around the world being drawn about Muhammad, zero. No one did. And why? Well, think about it. As long as it's a couple of people over there, um, or it's one guy there, uh, you can threaten and intimidate those sorts of people. Uh, if it's thousands of people, well, there's not a lot you can do. And so if, when I think about what you're suggesting, it's, hey, you know, the, these, these things could cause problems and cause riots, so don't do it. I think that's what causes the problem in the long run. As long as Muslims are used to their ideology being different and exempt from criticism, then the one or two people who manage to criticize it, then they can go after that person, they can kill that person, they can start the riots. Uh, think about it. Salman Rushdie pu pu uh, published um, uh, the Satanic Verses. I mean, people died over that. He's, I mean, he's, he's, still, he's, still under, uh, he's still under death sentence. How many books on cr criticizing Islam have been published since then? Who's dying over them? No one. So if you think about it, it's sort of whoever starts it off, that person is a target and that person has to die. But after that, Muslims can get used to it. And see, what I believe, I believe that apart from the ideology, uh, as far as human nature is concerned, Muslims are just like the rest of us, right? They have an ideology that I would reject, and I think the, the ideology is dangerous and violent. But as far as the person, I think the person is like the rest of us, and that you can kind of get used to things. And so th this idea that we have to keep them insulated, and we have to, uh, to tiptoe around them because we might hurt their feelings or, or psychologically traumatize them, I think it's the exact opposite, that if we sort of break through this, through this wall, and there are people, you know, there are people making cartoons about Muhammad and doing this, this or that to the, the Quran and making YouTube videos, uh, uh, you know, criticizing Muhammad or something like that. I think that very quickly that most Muslims can kind of get over the idea uh, that Islam is exempt from criticism. And then I don't think you end up with psychologically traumatized people and people flipping out. Again, thousands of cartoons, no one dies. Why? People had got used to it very, very quickly. I think Muslims in general, just like everyone else, can get used to um, having the religion criticized. When, if we don't do that, if we don't do that, we're sort of keeping the status quo where if one person stands up and does it or this person stands up and does it, that person can get killed. Um, so I, I, think, I think what you're suggesting is actually counterproductive and will lead to prolong. I mean, if we think two or three centuries from now, if we're still not allowed to, to criticize Islam the way we do everything else, 
uh, I think you're going to have the same problems. If we actually deal with the problem now, get it through everyone's mind that, that hey, we can put Muhammad on TV anytime we want. Uh, we can put him on YouTube anytime we want. If you don't like it, don't watch it. If we get that through, if we get that idea through, then you don't have these problems 10 years from now, let alone two or three centuries from now. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure if, that if Islam is even going to exist a century from now, let alone a couple of centuries. Maybe, maybe we disagree about that as well, Dave. Uh, but but when it comes to South Park, you know, they, they have a particular rating, and they're not just making fun of Jesus and Muhammad. They're doing all sorts of obscene things. So if a person tunes into that program, they, they, they should be prepared to view things that are offensive. I'm not against, you know, th that type of freedom of speech. If you're going to have the right precautions and, and make sure, you know, that a certain age group and certain, you know, population that is warned that this is the type of program it is, then you know, then 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 you can have that program, and there's a difference between criticizing Islam and then making fun of Islam, uh, not in in South Park, but in 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 the general public. If the president of the United States or some or some politician started to make fun of Islam or Christianity for that matter, or in, even beyond politician, well, if a teacher was doing it in a classroom. If your kids were sent to a classroom and the teacher was making fun of Christianity, that's not fair to you as a family and it's not fair to those kids who are going to be traumatized because Jesus is being, and the Bible is being made fun of in a public school. And so there's places, there's times and places to use free, free, the, those types of freedom of speeches uh, or the, those types of freedom of speech. And then there's places that are inappropriate and, and we need to be more sensitive Toward, to, towards pe whether calling people towards sanity rather driving them more into insanity and, and it all boils down to because it kind of started about you know uh, uh, apologetics and whatnot when we're inviting Muslims to consider alternative beliefs we have to put into perspective whether we're pushing them away or whether we're opening their hearts to what we have to share and in terms of those who are already hostile and rigid are we making them more rigid and more hostile and more insane by what we're doing? And I think that's what it comes down to. And I'm definitely not against criticizing Islam or publishing books, questioning you know, Islam or anything of that nature. It's how we do it, it's the words we choose, and, 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 it, and it's our sensitivity to, 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 to what's going on in, in, um, in, in the world and, and how people react psychologically so well I, I hope that that explains my side of things a little bit yes yes uh, we get your point and we get Dave's point uh, we're hearing you guys loud and clear now we're getting ready to go into a break and we're gonna come back shortly after our one minute break and for the next 25 minutes we're gonna have a space of time so you the audience out there you can call in and you can voice your opinion about what's being discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, is Dave right? Is Farhan right? Maybe you have a completely different opinion that disagrees with both of them. And you want to school both of them. Well, this is your time to come on and school both of them. You want to say something? Oh, uh, we're doing our little conclusions real quick? Your conclusion? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I think we get three minutes each. Three minutes, okay. Three minute conclusions each. Uh, sorry about that. All right, uh, Farhan, you ready to uh, each do a three minute conclusion? Go for it. All right. Um, all right, so Farhan and I, we agree on a lot of things. We agree that ISIS is a problem and terrorism is a problem. Um, we agree that certain things about Muhammad need to be shared. We disagree on tactics, um, you know, how, how confrontational should we be? I'm a bit more uh, confrontational. Uh, I think that that is what's needed. And when I say that, I don't mean that's what every person needs to do. I mean, there need to be certain people who are taking a kind of more confrontational uh, approach. Uh, I mean, you, you think about the situation we're in. Again, people are having their heads chopped off. If you look at the situation, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. We even have, now we have lone wolf attacks uh, here in the United States and Canada and Great Britain, and it looks like things are getting worse. Well, what are we, what, you know, how are we going to do? What, what are we going to do about that? If you, if you look, these people are, you know, they're converting to Islam based on silly, silly arguments. If, those, if the facts about Muhammad were common knowledge, if these facts were common knowledge 
I don't think a lot of these people would be converting to Islam if they, if they really had a clue. And I'm basing that on the fact that everything they tell me about Muhammad is just wrong. It's wrong according to the Muslim sources. So I conclude if they actually knew the, the truth, the reality of Muhammad, uh, I, I would say at least some of them uh, certainly wouldn't um, have converted to Islam and wouldn't have lost their lives. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Farhan would agree that some of the facts about Muhammad need to become, uh, you know, be put into the public domain here. Um, so it comes down to tactics. And, you know, again, it, it's, it, people think, hey, you're criticizing Islam, you're making fun of Muhammad, you're, you're criticizing the Quran, you must hate Muslims. I'm th I always, I always, always, I'm thinking big picture. I'm thinking five years down the road, ten years down the road. And when I look and I see that there are Muslims in the world who still get violent and start, will start killing people over cartoons or a YouTube video, I say, here are people who need to get used to having their religion criticized. Are, are people going to have their, their feelings hurt? Are people going to get upset? You know, could, could people become you know, uh, angry over this? Uh, sure, but if you're talking about the big picture, it seems like a wall that we need to get through. And again, I don't just think this is, this is good for me or for Westerners. I think this is good for Muslims, too. If we sort of win the free speech battle, which I would say needs to be won at all costs, if we get through that to where Islam is just as fair game as Christianity, so if, if, if a person doesn't want to criticize Christianity or Islam, that's fine. But if a person wants to criticize Islam or Christianity, um, he, he, he has that option without you know, being killed. And so we have to break through that wall. I don't see any other way to do it other than, than just doing it. And feelings are going to get hurt. But I mean, come on, this is a religion that calls me the worst of creatures. This is a religion that commands its adherents to violently subjugate me. If that's not going to psychologically traumatize people, I don't see why they'd be psychologically traumatized by me telling them the facts about their prophet. Thank you, David. And Farhan, your three minutes now. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And thank, thanks, ABN. Thanks, CL, uh, for, for having me. I, I think this is a very, very important topic that, that needs to be discussed over and over and over again between politicians, between, uh, between apologists, and, and, and between the general public who's concerned about Islam. Uh, I, I think how should we confront, it, confront the, the, the Islamic challenge? And it's a great topic, and I'm glad that we finally had to discuss it a little bit. Um, I, I do think that's, that, that love ultimately wins. Um, and one of my favorite Christian pastors, uh, name, the name of his book is Love Wins. But anyways, but love ultimately does win. It, it, it's what steals hearts. It, it what, it, it's what transforms people into, into beautiful and more spiritual people. And I, I really do believe that hostility feels when, when hostility is fueled by more hostility, that it causes further chaos, more hurt, uh, more more trauma, uh, and uh, more animosity. And, and that's just a, generally speaking, on from a psychological perspective, that's what happens. Whether we're talking about Islam or whether we're talking about any other topic, you know, negativity negativity fuels negativity, and love is what heals people. And so in terms of apologetics, no matter how rigid or hostile the opposition is, I really do believe that you should love your enemy and that you, sh you should turn the other cheek. And, um, you know, eventually, even if their lives are lost and they're killing people and they're persecuting people, um, eventually love will win. And if their hearts won't be transformed, then, you know, God willing, their, their children's hearts will. Um, so that's, that's, that's the stance that I take. Uh, I respect Dave if he wants to, uh, you know, continue uh, insulting and making fun of Muhammad. David is a brother of mine. I disagree with his tactics if he does that. Um, and I think that there are better ways to uh, engage Muslims. No. Okay. Thank you very much. And don't forget, we have 25 minutes where we're going to have the phone lines open after we come back from this break. And we'll be back in a moment. We're opening the phone lines up for the next 25 minutes to get some input from our audience. And we have three callers at the moment. And when our, fir our first caller tonight is uh, Richard. And can we get Richard on the line? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. All right, uh, hello. My name is Richard Bush. I'm delighted to be on with you. And I'll be as fast as possible because I know there are people on behind me. I, if we're considering bringing facts into the public arena, I wonder which facts would be most effective in the public arena. Perhaps we should consider bringing into the arena the historical facts about Jesus. 
I mean, for us to just expose embarrassing facts about Muhammad, well, the effect that sort of like when John down the cross and said that Jesus' body was eaten by dogs, we just give this knee-jerk reaction, this emotionally charged reaction, rather than wanting to consider what he's saying because it's so offensive to us. So rather than just attacking Muhammad, it might be better to put out in the public arena facts about Jesus. And this will have two full effects. One, teaching people about Jesus, that he claimed to be God, he called men to worship him, even in the earliest gospel, the Gospel of Mark. And secondly, it would expose the Islamic claim that Jesus did not claim to be God. So in this way, people would be equally as skeptical about uh, Islam as they would about um, if we put out the facts about Muhammad's life on the table. Yet Muslims might not be as defensive or angry as if we embarrass their beloved prophet. And at the same time, talking about Jesus would be a bridge to preaching the gospel. So uh, do you think that centralizing our emphasis uh, rather on Christ's claims about himself, his crucifixion, and his resurrection would be a more effective strategy? Well, there's, there's no conflict between the two, right? I mean, he, here we have programs all the time defending the deity of Christ, uh, defending Jesus' mm -hmm. death and resurrection. I've had multiple debates with, uh, with Muslims on the resurrection and things like that. So, uh, so, so there's no conflict between getting the, getting the facts about Jesus out there and getting the facts uh, about Muhammad on the table. Um, I'll, say that both are, I'll, I'll say that both are important. Uh, my best friend in college was a, was a guy named Nabil Qureshi who works with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Um, but, but I'll tell you why both are important. Um, Nabil didn't tell me this until after he became a Christian, but uh, when he was, uh, uh, he was an Ahmadi Muslim, uh, but when, he when we would argue about the resurrection and the deity of Christ and the reliability of the New Testament, Nabil got to a point where he told me, he didn't tell me this until later, he told me that he realized I had a strong case for Jesus' death by crucifixion and Jesus' resurrection and uh, the deity of Christ and the reliability of the New Testament. So he agreed with me uh, that I had a good case, but he thought to himself, even if David shows me with 99% certainty that all of these things are true, I am still 100% certain that Islam is true. And so Islam wins. Islam wins because he has complete confidence in Islam. He said it wasn't until later when he started to doubt Islam based on us going through facts um, about Muhammad and about Muhammad's history that he started to doubt Islam. And then he was able to sort of put everything on the table. But when we were just sharing facts about, uh, about the deity of Christ and the resurrection, he was still completely confident that Islam is 100% certain. And that's kind of what we, we, we need to get facts about Muhammad and Islam on the table because there are lots of Muslims who think like that because that's all they've ever been exposed to. So think about it. If a Muslim all his life has only been exposed to the claim that Islam is 100% certain and it's proven by science and proven by history and proven by logic and proven by reason and proven by everything and we don't share the truth with them, then that's all they've heard. They've gotten one side of the issue. I believe Muslims need both sides of the issue so that they can make a more informed decision. That's true about you know, the facts about Christianity and, and the facts about Islam. So I'm for all the facts on the table as much as possible. Thank you. Are we going to let uh, Farhan? Uh, if, he, if Farhan wants to, uh, wants to respond, he can, or we can go on to the next caller. Farhan, do you want to respond, or you just want to go to the next caller? No, I agree with Dave. We can go to the next caller. Okay. Yeah. Right, thank you, Richard. We thank you for that call. And our next caller is Vincent. Vincent, uh, are you there? Vincent? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. What okay, is your I'm question sorry. for our debaters tonight? Well, I have a uh, question but a short comment. Uh, I'm going to stick to the subject of what you're... Uh... Hello? Yeah. Yes, we hear you. Okay, how should we confront Islamic challenge? And the short answer is, at least in my personal opinion, is simply get off your land. And I'll use this analogy. If I broke into David's house and I subjugated him, his, his wife, his children didn't leave, wouldn't let them leave. But every day I saw him, I teased and put down his belief. Oh, your God was a rapist. He ain't real. He ain't this. I think what it does is ask yourself to injury. I think the short answer is if you want to confront your Islamic challenge, get off the land. Because if someone invaded here, if someone invaded Christian land, you would do whatever you had to do, not to save your God, but to save your family, to save the people you love. Then these people, these humans, like we all are, are no different than anybody else. No one knows the path of God. We all guess it. And you give merit to your guess by your actions, not by your words. I appreciate the call, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, I I'll let Farhan add to this. I'll just say one quick thing. Um, President Obama took office, and he said, we are getting off their land, right? We're getting out of Iraq. 
And his military advisors say, if you do that, there are some radical dudes who are ready to take over. And nope, we are getting off their land because us being there is the problem. Let's get off the land. They got off the land, and now the situation is ISIS. So if you're just saying, hey, pull, pull out completely, uh, you know, by, by the way, I'm not, I'm not for the war and so on, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm for practical consequences. Um, think, what is preventing ISIS from just annihilating everyone? They're growing. They, they, have, they have a thousand new foreign soldiers coming in every month from around the world. Uh, the idea, hey, just get out of there and they'll all be happy. No, they'll all be, they'll all be beheaded by ISIS. And so uh, as much as you don't like the United States and what they've done, and again, I think the United States has done all kinds of stupid things. I think that's kind of the ruling policy is let's do some of the dumbest things we can possibly do. But just this blanket, hey, let's stay out of it you're going to end up with a lot of suffering uh, people over there because the people who are vying for power right now um, are a lot worse than anything the United States is, uh, is going to do. And in other words, we are at a point in history where I don't care if it comes from the United States or from, uh, you know, from the countries over there, uh, someone, someone needs to defend people um, against ISIS. So the idea, just get out of there and everything will be okay. No, get out of there and everything is going to be subjugated uh, by the Islamic State. Okay. For Han, do, do you have something to say about that? Uh, uh, I, I think I agree with David on that one as well. I wish it was as simple as just get them, get the military, or get the troops, or get you know America out of their lands. I mean, it sounds simple, but but it's an idealistic, but it's not. It's not realistic at all. And uh, history has shown uh, that you know at this point it's not realistic. Um, you know, I, ISIS is the obvious. Everything David basically said. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Vincent. We thank you for calling and uh, expressing yourself. And uh, we have a third caller. Uh, I believe it's Shakir. Are you there? Shakir? Okay. So uh, first, congratulations for the new channel. And then uh, uh, for Dr. David, um, for... Uh, uh, okay. So for uh, Dr. Um, David, and um, uh, actually I appreciate your effort and uh, uh, your opinion about uh, Islam, which cannot withstand criticism. Actually, uh, I think that uh, you are uh, following what's happening in the Middle East these days and about the apologetics uh, to the extent that uh, in Egypt especially, there are uh, someone like uh, apologetic uh, called Islam al he is now starting to 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 to, to say what is uh, written inside this al bukhari and saying that it is uh, it cannot be uh, accepted and also like uh, ibrahim isa is saying the same and also there is another one called hamad abdul samad he says that the uh, ayat al salm ayat al salm in, in in quran should abrogate Ayat al Harb. This is contrary to what is happening these days. You know, uh, they say that uh, uh, the, this ayah of uh, to, uh, uh, which is uh, for, uh, in Surah al uh, Qital, this they say that it abrogated all all the peace verse from the Quran. He is saying that we should make the we, we should not make the reverse. He, they want to abrogate the, uh, the, the verses of uh, struggle, you know? So, uh, first, uh, the question now, uh, can, is Islam liable to reformation or not? The question um. is, is Islam is liable to information? So, so, so it, the, the question is, the, swesh, the, the question is, can Islam be reformed? And uh, I, 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 I would say on a, on a personal level, on the level of the person, um, Islam can be reformed. In other words, uh, as, as we've already discussed, um, an individual, an individual um, can interpret the Quran. You know, I could pick up the Quran and think it means anything uh, that I want it to mean. Um, so on a personal, individual level, uh, Islam can be reformed, and that's why you, you have plenty of you have plenty of nice, peaceful Muslims that you know would be some of the nicest people you've you've ever met. But at the same time, there is a, a core there, and there's a reason that a lot of the you know the terrorist attacks and, and things like that uh, seem to be 
uh, coming out of one particular ideology. And so, I mean, at, at, at the end of the day, the Quran claims over and over again to be perfectly clear in its commands, right? So the Quran says over and over again, it's, it's, uh, these are the verses of the clear book. Um, these are the verses that are explained in detail. These are the books that are, that are expounded in detail. It says things like this over and over again. The, 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 <clears throat> the commands of the Quran are supposedly clear. And then you have Allah over and over again demanding complete submission and obedience. So 465 says that people, Muslims can have no faith until they make Muhammad judge in all decisions and find in themselves no resistance to his commands. And so if you look at that and say, well, Allah says it's, Allah says it's clear. Uh, Allah says, I can have no real faith. I'm not a real Muslim unless I make Muhammad the judge and I have no resistance against Muhammad's decisions. Then when you open Muhammad's decisions and, and find something about you know, uh, killing apostates or something like that, th that's Islam, right? That's Islam. So a person can interpret Islam however he wants. Islam is what it is. You know, the nice Muslim who lives down the street or the, the Muslim who reinterprets it is not, has never been, and never will be an authoritative source of Islamic doctrine or practice. Islam is what it is. And so it, there are always going to be the problems because, at, you know, as, for, as Farhan points out, that there are different people, uh, different kinds of people who do things differently. There are always going to be the kinds of people who say, um, look, if this is my religion, I'm going to do whatever it says. Let me open it up. I don't care what anyone else says. I'm just going to do whatever this commands me, and they're going to open it up and read, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Or they're going to open it up and read, uh, you know, you, if anyone leaves this Islamic religion, chop off his head. So that's what the sort of that's that's the problem is that you have different kinds of people. Yeah, lots of people will will you know will interpret things peacefully, but there are the sorts of people. I'm one of them. CL is one of them who say you know if if I'm going to follow something, I'm you know that that's that's what I'm going to follow and I'm going to do what it says. And those kinds of people, I think, will always open up the Quran, find it, and I think you're going to have jihad. So can it just be? completely reformed as a religion, uh, I don't think so. Again, on a personal basis, yeah, uh, on, you know, as far as Islam itself, Islam, it's already been defined. Hmm. Farhan, do you have uh, something, some input on that? Sure, I, I think Dave has a legit point with that. I, I think when you look at neuroscience, you have the two hemispheres of the brain, the right brain and the left brain. And, and generally speaking, you know, we use the entire brain, but there is definitely certain people who incline towards a literalistic approach to life in general not just scripture but life in general and so they, they, they view and perceive everything quite literally and then there's others who see the more abstract who can who see the gray rather than the black and white and um, the two ty the, the, the chemistry influences their their outlook and, and their perception uh, on life so so David you know being quite a literalist interprets things quite literally and so when he reads the Bible he's thinking that okay this is literal where he's somebody else who, who who thinks more in the abstract might might look at the Bible and interpret it metaphorically now who's right and who's wrong I'm not we're not gonna get into it but the idea is that people do perceive these things differently I think that there's the, that when the baby boomers die off which is you know my parents and a lot of our parents uh, Dave probably your parents are baby boomers I don't know CL I don't know if your da parents are baby boomers but they're very traditional right and and our grandparents were extremely traditional but but even with the baby boomers as traditional as they are they were open up to diversity and plurality like never before in history especially in the United States but you know even with the internet and globalization and all that and so they're exposed to a lot more information. And I think when the baby boomers die off, and then when our generation dies off, I think that the future generations are going to perceive things a little bit differently. I think that will, will call for a more metaphorical interpretation of Islam for the future generations if they're going to be reasonable with what's there in science and in psychology and sociology and all, these, you know, all of these academia fields. Um, that they're going to perceive Islam differently, and then eventually Islam is going to phase out. That's if I were to make a prediction. That's what I think is going to happen. Thank you very much, and we uh, we thank you, Shakir, for your uh, call, and we move on to our next caller. Uh, our next caller, uh, Vincent. Do, what? No, not, not Vincent. Sorry. Uh, no, that's a radical moderate. Oh, radical no. moderate. Oh, there goes there goes the show. <laughs> Cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, a couple couple points. Well, a question and a, and a point of hope if we got time. Uh -huh. um, first, first thing is for for uh, for on, um, you crazy hippie, you. Um, 
I was listening. <laughs> I was listening to an NPR show a while ago, and they had a psychologist on who was uh, working in uh, the Middle East, and she said basically that the whole culture of the Middle East seems to be one of whoever feigns outrage first, whoever uh, you know yells the loudest that they've been insulted when two people or, or you know or groups of people are interacting. Um, those are the people um, who, who win the argument, who win the debate. In other words, you know, that, you know, someone says, you know, oh, you've insulted me, and then the other person is taken back and apologizing um, um, for, you know, for insulting the person, even if they didn't, and that seems to kind of set the tone. Do you got any thoughts on that? You, you're directing that to Farhan? Yeah, that was Farhan. Yeah, to Farhan, yes. Yeah, I think that culturally speaking that there are th those, those types of things that are there. Um, the, the more dominant, because they're, they're very uh, authoritarian, you know, totalitarian type of culture, or at least it's, it, you know, coming from the past into the present, they have been very authoritarian. Um, and so d showing that dominance is definitely, um, it's, uh, psychologically, it proves something to them. But I think that, that, that uh, the human dynamics are, beyond, are a little bit more elaborate and complicated than that. And so... Um, but I think that you're right, Rad. I, I I do think that 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 is a an accurate um, an accurate stereotype, if you will. Thank you for thinking. All right. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I'm good with that. We're good. Mm -hmm. We're good. All right. Thank you, Rad Moderate, for calling in and uh, schooling these uh, these, <laughs> these these guys who think they know something. Um, we're moving on to our next caller, and we have on the, on the line Mark. Mark, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, uh, we hear you. Can you turn Mark up a little? Yeah. Yeah, turn me up a little. Okay, Mark, uh, tell us uh, your, your question or some of your wisdom. All right, we'll see if I give any wisdom. Well, I've been watching things on TV for some time now, and what's going on with Islam, and it just seems like there's something inherently wrong in the religion that is being passed on to its adherents, it, or, you know, its people. Like uh, the Muslim um, young men who throw acid in the face of another Muslim woman because she doesn't want to marry him or date him. Or, like, I was just watching Frontline and, uh, about ISIS a few days ago, and I, it was showing um, where ISIS was taking over in the, in the Shiite areas, they were, they, were, they were murdering the Shiites in the streets, and they, were, they had them tied up, and they were shooting them in the head with an AK. And it just, and just, they just, they act like two-year-olds. They have no self-control over themselves, and I think it's something inherently being taught to them by their religion. Okay. So uh, who wants to go first on that one? Yeah, um, I, I will. Uh, what I, what I was certain certain Muslims can do things that aren't actually commanded by the religion. So you don't open up the Quran and find you know throw acid in, in the faces of women. Um, what what you do find is, is sort of a, a lot of uh, you know commands about you know women being uh, submissive and so on and and that if if women are getting out of line, men want to teach them a lesson. Men want to punish them. So you you do have that sort of uh, trend in Islam, and, and this can erupt in various ways. And one of those would be throwing acid in women's faces. As far as as far as ISIS, you know, s shooting Shias, that goes within it. That, that you can defend. Um, you know, Surah 9, verse 73 of the Quran uh, commands Muslims to wage jihad against unbelievers and hypocrites. So if you regard Shia as a hypocrite, you would think, well, I'm commanded to wage um, jihad. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we do have this problem, but w one of the interesting things was, uh, I didn't catch it until uh, Farhan was giving his conclusion, uh, but we, we have sort of different, different, uh, different views of, of love, whereas, whereas Farhan has a, uh, you know, he's associating the, the, the love with, you know, niceness and kindness. Um, I think you can blast someone in, in love. In other words, when Jesus says, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, I don't believe he's, he's, he's being hateful. I think he's that's the most loving thing he could do. In other words, if, uh, if my friend Farhan here, if he walks out of, his, uh, you know, out of his house tomorrow and says, hey, I can fly, I'm going to tell him how ridiculous that is. You know, if he get, became delusional and thought he could fly, I'm going to tell him how ridiculous that is. If he goes up on top of a building to, building to demonstrate, I'm actually going to tackle him. 
not because, oh, I'm so violent and I want to I tackle for Han. No, because, look, that's about the most loving thing I can do in that situation. And as you pointed out, there, I mean, there, there is just atrocity after atrocity after atrocity every time I, I turn on the news. And so, you know, I think, some, I think someone needs to shout. I think someone needs to, uh, uh, to start shouting, in, in, you know, in a metaphorical sense where we need to start laying it down and stop, you know, and stop, uh, you know, pulling punches with Islam and, and walking on tippy toes. Uh, around it, we need to lay out the truth and say, look guys, this isn't true, it's not true, it's not true, stop killing and, and, and doing all the things you're doing for it. Thank you, David. And Farhan, do you have something to say about this particular statement and topic? I, I didn't catch the statement entirely. I caught David's response. Um, maybe we can, I, I'll just go with what David said. I, I do want to say in terms of what, what David said about love, the way that I define it is unconditional an unconditional embrace of anyone and everyone, bar none. So meaning that there's no conditions on me embracing you, and that's what God does. God is unconditional love. God loves unconditionally. Um, but embracing or accepting people unconditionally uh, could, I, I agree with it, could include uh, an assertive, um, you know, outside of kindness type of uh, of approach i wouldn't disagree with his de that that type of definition of love I i'm not sure if dave and i agree whether it's conditional or unconditional though um but that's a different topic okay okay and we have one more caller jose yes yes i'm on okay yeah, we hear you can you uh, hear me yes i can hear you go ahead okay uh, go ahead with yeah. your statement or question yeah, I have uh, three questions, actually. Uh -oh. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> the first question I'd like to ask is, who validated Muhammad's uh, prophethood? Uh, because I know that when he went to the cave, he thought that he was, might have been possessed by, uh, by being afflicted by demons, by demon jinn. And then uh, he also thought that it was like, uh, might have been a demon that visited him. But who was the one who validated his uh, prophethood? Because maybe he was right the first time. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, 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 Jose, we we only have a couple minutes left before we have to cut off the show. So please give us your other questions real quick, and then we'll have to answer them sort of rapid the fire. Other, the other question is, uh, why did the Jews want to kill Jesus if he affirmed uh, their beliefs, like the Torah, the Old Testament? Who? Why did the Jews want to kill Jesus? The Quran says that you know that he seemed like he went along with the, the whole program. It's like why did the Jews want to kill him then? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll answer those, and then Farhan can, uh, can add anything he wants. Who validated Muhammad's prophethood? Uh, Muslims could say you know, it was validated later on by various things, but, but at, at, the first, at, at the earliest stage, um, yeah, you're right. Muhammad thought he was demon-possessed. He tried to hurl himself off a cliff. Uh, the, whatever it was that was uh, addressing him wouldn't let him. Muhammad goes back. He's, 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 he's suicidal. He's calling on um, Khadija to, to cover him, but it's, it's Khadija and, and Waraka who, who said, no, you're not possessed, you're a prophet. And so that's, that's the first validation. Uh, that's the first claim that Muhammad is a, is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is a prophet, as far as something that Muhammad believed. Uh, as far as why the Jews would want to kill Jesus, um, that, that, is, that is a good question, and I brought this up to Muslims before, because it makes perfect sense, if the Christian view is correct, that people would want to kill Jesus, because Jesus is going around making claims that only God uh, should be making about himself and you know the records of the G of Jesus trial and so on that's exactly what he was accused of blasphemy um, the Muslim perspective where Jesus is going around telling people just believe in God believe in God you'd wonder who would get angry at that uh, who in first century Israel would get mad at that sort of Jesus and so Muslims will say it's something about claiming to be the Messiah or something like this or he was a he was a threat to their power or something like that um, but does doesn't exactly fit much because there were tons of people in first century Israel who were winning followers going around uh, telling people, hey, believe in God, serve God. Uh, it's not clear how, who, who, who Jesus would have offended. Uh, but yeah, Muslims would generally say, you know, he was, uh, you know, what he was doing was an affront to the religious leaders or something like that. Okay. Uh, we have very little time left. So Farhan, do you want to get in there and uh, say what you have to say something about that uh, question? Or that, um, that sure. I, I think, I also believe that Muhammad had some sort of mystical experience in the cave. Now, whether what that was Temporal lobe epilepsy, whether it was sleep paralysis or or due to due to uh, sleep deprivation or whatever, he had some sort of mystical experience, and he believed that he was demon possessed. And who validated that he was a prophet was Waraka bin Nawafel, who was the uncle of Khadija, and he was some type of Christian. I don't think he was an Orthodox Christian. I think he was a heterodox Christian, 
and he was teaching him Christianity among others and uh, he was telling him that he's a prophet of God. He was telling him, it, Muhammad never thought it was Gabriel. Uh, you know, Waraka bin Nawafil told him it was Jibrail, if you read the hadith. Now, in regards to the Jews, and uh, Jesus was claiming divinity. He was claiming to be the I am, and um, he's claiming to be the Moshiach, and that upset the Jews to the point where uh, they, uh, they, they did what they, you know, they did what they did, according to, to the Bible. Okay, um, so there we. I, th I believe we have one last caller. No caller left. No, I think we're what? one. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, that's it. Okay, good. We're so, out of time, anyways. So. <laughs> yes, we are out of time. This was a uh, a wonderful show. The topic again was how should we confront the Islamic challenge. You heard from uh, both of our speakers today, Farhan Qureshi and David Wood. Both came with their uh, points. Uh, so. This is a topic for you to continue to think about and continue to ask yourself, how should we deal with the Islamic challenge? And um, we're basically out of time at this point. So keep tuning in, in into uh, the Trinity channel. There are going to be more shows. The, the marathon is continuing. And don't forget, it is time to wake up. Now is the time for you to wake up and come into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much for tuning in.